In 2005, uh, David Foster Wallace, who was an American novelist and short story writer, was uh, giving a commencement speech at a college. And he began it with this parable. And I'm going to paraphrase part of it. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the heck is water? I think this is an apt metaphor for uh, life and the things that we swim in in culture and life and the things that we do without even thinking about it that a lot of us are being formed and shaped and guided by these proverbial waters that are leading us in directions. And we may, not all of it's bad, but we may not even be aware of what it is that's happening to us. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says it like this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so we started last week a series on our values as a church, connection, formation, and mission. Connection being about connecting with God, ourselves, and with others. Formation being about becoming who we are created to be, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then mission, uh, which is about joining with God and what he's already doing in the world. And so last week we talked about this, uh, I'm not going to make everybody do it again, but I asked everybody in the room if they felt lonely at all this past year. And as you probably would guess, pretty much everybody, maybe not everybody, but almost, raised their hands and said, yes. I raised both hands. If I wouldn't fall, I would raise both my feet as well. And we talked about this longing that we have within us, this deep craving for something more, and that we go about trying to connect to uh, God or connecting, filling this void via things like uh, possessions, pleasure, and influence. We talked about trying to fill this void, this longing in our hearts through all these things that ultimately don't satisfy. And the question I posed was, what if actually the longing that you have is not evidence of a fault with you, but actually is precisely evidence of what it is that you were made for? Uh, Blaise Pascal, who was, um, I think, from the 17th uh, century, said something in the, the paraphrase that he's known for is something like that we have a God-shaped vacuum in the side, inside of our hearts. That's not the exact quote, but that's kind of the, the premise of it. And so we go about trying to fill this in a number of different ways. Uh, one might be through the relentless pursuit of possessions. And the problem with a lot of the things that we go to fill these desires that we have is that they promise that they will alleviate a pain and then end up perpetuating the very pain that they say they will relieve. In other words, so when we go out trying to mainly dedicate our life to pursuing possessions, we may get more, but also we end up realizing we want more and more and more and more and more. And it forms within us, if we're going to talk about formation, perhaps a, a heart of greediness uh, and materialism. Uh, Jim Carrey uh, famously had a line of, I wish that everyone could be rich and famous so that they'd realize it's not the answer to anything. Then there's the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, and I referenced uh, a work by Dr. Archibald Hart named Thrilled, to, uh, named Thrilled to Death about this thing called anhedonia, which basically is this premise that through the relentless pursuit of pleasure and getting more dopamine hits, we think we're actually getting more pleasure, but it's actually leading us to live a less than pleasurable life and numbing us not only to the negative, but numbing us to the positive. And so it promises to alleviate pain, but actually ends up leading us to live a less than pleasurable sort of life. And then lastly, talked about influence uh, and how this perpetual feeling that a lot of us have that I'm not making enough difference in the world actually can uh, hinder us from actually making the difference that God has actually called us to do in the world. And so this week, we are moving on from connection about connecting with God, yourself, and others and abiding in the vine into formation, which is about who we are becoming. And the basic idea is that you are becoming somebody. Is that fair? You're being shaped into someone. And over the course of your life, you are becoming more or less of certain things. A practical example would be one that I shared a few weeks ago, uh, which is that I was a competitive swimmer uh, growing up. If I said again, I would like to become a competitive swimmer. I can say that, right? Uh, But what do I need to do to become a competitive swimmer? Swim. What have I not done in quite some time? Swim, yes, uh, unless you count like floating around in the pool with, with my son and looking for frogs that were not really in the pool except one time. 
the opposite actually would probably be true if you were to look at my habits. My habits are not only uh, not making me into a swimmer, but a number of my habits would probably be doing the opposite of making me into a swimmer. Probably should change some of the things that I eat, you know what I mean? <laughs> if I wanted to be a competitive swimmer again. And the same thing is true with character. We intuitively recognize this for things like uh, becoming an athlete or growing in like physical strength. But the same thing is true with your character. If you say you want to grow in things like patience and peace, to become a person of peace and joy, but you're doing things in your life that regularly teach you that you can be instantly gratified and you're living in a chaotic sort of way, it might be pretty hard to develop into a person of peace and patience. And so there are a number of things uh, that form us and shape us. Uh, one would be that of technology. Um, if you have a question, where do you go? Google or YouTube, right? I do it. It's great, right? Um, usually. If you have a question about like what you need to do in your house, Google it, YouTube it, check it out. If you have a question about God, where do you go? Let's be honest, it's Google, YouTube. If you're like me, that's what we generally tend to do. We go to things that instantly gratify us. They get us the answer immediately. Um, and there's a lot of really great and wonderful things that we're able to do because of this access. I'm not trying to demonize or diminish that. But what I do want to just point out is if in every area of our life, we are being formed to believe that I can get what I want when I want it and I can get it in immediate access, what do you think that does when you're walking through a really painful season and you're like, God, why the heck is this still going on? Google's not gonna tell you a really great answer. Maybe it will, sometimes I, sometimes I still try. <laughs> you probably do too. Well, I'll speak for me, I do. If in every aspect of our life we're going to get an immediate answer, how in the world are we supposed to be able to sit in the tension and unanswered questions? There's a uh, philosopher and theologian named A.J. Swoboda uh, who talked about how sometimes God's greatest gifts come to us in the form of unanswered questions. That if God is God, and I am not, it would make sense that if there is a God, God is bigger than me, and God is bigger than I can fully understand. Is that a fair assessment? Then it would make sense that I don't know things. So thank you for listening to me anyways. It would make sense that God knows things that I do not. And so this pursuit of instant gratification in every area of life, which Instant gratification is not always bad. Sometimes there's good things that come out of it. But if, if in every area of my life I'm being formed to believe that I can get what I want when I want it in the immediate, then of course it becomes really hard to trust God when I don't get what I want and I'm living in a season of life that is really hard and difficult and I've been praying and praying and praying. Well, I must not be praying right because Google could certainly give me the answer. Social media would be another one related to this. Um, I'm not going to ask you all to raise your hands either, but this is something I think about. Great. I, I love it. I love it, Carlos. Uh, how many of you cared what someone you went to high school with 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, was doing this weekend prior? William, you did care. Okay, good for you, man. Um, how many of you actually like cared enough that when the first thing you woke up in the morning, you were like, all right, I need to check on Instagram or Facebook and like see what all these people were up to? How many of you cared 15, like 15 years ago? I didn't. Admittedly, I, don't, I was very shy, so I don't know that I had that many friends. <laughs> but I certainly didn't care uh, that much about all the stuff that's going on. How many of you ever, ever have found yourself on the internet getting upset, agitated by people that you've never met, probably never will meet, never have any interaction with whatsoever? And then you find yourself emotionally depleted with the people that you feel close with. Oh. It's a painful realization for me. Oh man, I'm investing emotional energy in things and people that I don't even care about. And even if I do have a relationship with them, it would be much better for me to do this in person. I'm not demonizing social media. I use it. I have it. But I am saying that it's doing something to us. It's causing us to care about things that I once used not to even care about. And now it is ingrained not only into my heart, but into my hands where I grab my phone without even thinking. And maybe you do the same. It's causing us to struggle with comparison more, dedicating emotional energy to it. I, um, I'm paraphrasing here, and I can't remember exactly uh, where, where I read it, but these things are forming us to be attracted to personal depth, but repelled by patience. 
to be attracted to the idea of wisdom and growing in wisdom, but repelled by something like embracing our limitations. Another way to think about it uh, would be from a financial mindset. Uh, to continue that social media thing, uh, at least during uh, the earlier part of the pandemic, I would get on my like TikTok or Reels or whatever, and I would get those like quick money-making things. Not necessarily money-making schemes, but I guess kind of that, you know, like day trading. And all these people are like, hey, if you do this, then you're going to get really rich really quick. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I never actually did it, but I was always very uh, intrigued by it. Something called day trading, right, where you, uh, you learn the stocks, you invest in something, and you get rich kind of quickly. This is contrasted with compound interest, which is investing in something over a long period of time. And over a long period of time, we're seeing the return on dividends. And I would venture to say that a lot of us have been formed by an instant gratification day trading mindset when it comes to God. That I think I'm going to pick up my Bible, I'm going to read it, and a word's going to jump off the page the first time, and I am going to be radically changed. Can God do that? Yes, he can. Does he do that? Yes, I believe so. But are there also times when I read this, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I do not remember what I read? Yes. Is that bad? Questionable. (laughs) That's fair. We overestimate what can happen to us in a day, but underestimate what God can do in us over a lifetime of long obedience in the same direction. Of following after Jesus, of engaging in these things, getting these things into our bodies. Um, Like some days you will feel it. Some days you'll have something pop off off the page to you and praise God when that happens. You have a moment in prayer that just feels wonderful. Then other days you're gonna pray and you're gonna feel absolutely nothing. But over the course of your life, what God does in you it's, he grows that exponentially over time. Another thing that forms us is busyness. If I was to ask you, uh, how are you? A number of us would say, I'm good, just busy. Um, college students, busy. Grad students, busy. Young professionals, busy. Uh, young parents, busy. Uh, cross the board, I'm good, I'm fine, just busy. Uh, there's a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer that I think, yeah, Riley, you're, you're reading right now. Um, and John Mark Comer was a pastor, and he was talking to, uh, he talk, told a story about his mentor, John Ortberg. And John Ortberg consulted with his mentor, Dallas Willard, who was a philosopher. And he said, how do I become the me that I want to be? And Willard paused for a while, as was custom for Willard to just make people wait, I guess, and think. And he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And Ortberg responded back, okay, what else? (laughs) Willard responded back, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Corey Ten Boom, are you familiar with who she is? Um, She was a Dutch watchmaker, and her and her dad helped many Jewish people escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust, and said something to the extent of, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. That's strong language, isn't it? It cuts you off from connection with God. If you think about it in a practical note in relationship with someone, right, if you're constantly walking around with headphones in, doing other things, I might be here with you, but I'm not paying any attention to you. How in the world are we supposed to grow in intimacy? Uh, Carl Jung, are you familiar with him? Carl Jung, who was a famous psychologist whose work became the basis for the Myers-Briggs personality test, said that hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Yeah, strong language, right? And so many of us are constantly hurried and constantly busy. Now, if I was to push back on our busyness, I would say, How busy are we actually if we were to pull out our phones and look how much time we spend on social media? Check your Netflix logs. Are we as busy as we say we are or are we fleeing from actually the life that God has made us for? Um, Another one, uh, Tucker, can I get you to hand me my guitar? Another thing that forms us is, uh, and I don't know if this is true as much for, I'm a millennial, so I don't know if this is as much true for Gen Z or not, but Um, Did anybody else kind of grow up with the, I don't know that I heard this in the home, but just general in the air, this mantra of you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up? I'm, great. I'm just going to come out and say, I don't think that's true. (laughs) 
Good. It sounds like y'all all have recognized that. That's not a fun thing to recognize, is it? Uh, we have a culture in general that doesn't want us to embrace our limitations, that actually causes us to run from limitations, that sees limitations as actually a form of keeping us from the freedom that we are meant to live. But what if actually you already do have limitations based on uh, where you come from, based on your age, based on your stage of life, based on your gift set, based on struggles that you have, based on like so many different things. Uh, we think of limitations sometimes as being bad, and we translate this also into our relationship with God. So we think of, all right, God says this is good, this is bad. Well, oh man, I don't really want to do anything with that. God loving me, cool. Like, I'm all for that. Limitations, let's keep that off. I want to be free in my relationship with God. But is that actually leading you to be free? So if you think about it with, um, with an instrument, right? Um, a guitar has a very specific way that it's meant to be played. Is that fair? So if I was to pick up the guitar and try to play it like this, am I being free? Yes, I'm doing whatever the heck I want to do with this thing. Um, but the guitar wasn't designed for that. It's designed for a particular way of playing, right? And if the same way, if I'm thinking about uh, with music in general, learning my scales, learning my chord structures, learning all of this stuff, and I'm just, well, actually that is a chord. Well, that is a chord too. Sorry, my hands, I've been playing a little bit of playing for a while, so it's kind of ingrained into my body a little bit. Um, if I just try to play whatever I want to play, it sounds terrible, right? But am I being free? In one sense, yes, but what if actually by learning, learning the chords and the structures and being able to play around that actually leads me into the freedom of the life that I was made to live. That the freedom that we're promised to live by not embracing our limitations actually leads to chaos, but the freedom of embracing the limitations that God has for us actually leads to beauty. What if actually limitations are good for you and through embracing your limitations in addition to your giftings, God actually will help reveal to you the beauty that you are created for? Of course, there are a number of things, uh, other things that form us. We could go into the ones that I mentioned last week of possessions, uh, pleasure, influence as well. But the question becomes, last week I talked about who were you, like who were you created to be? Uh, you're created to be a person of love who loves God with all that you are and loves your neighbor as yourself. I preached on that two weeks ago. And then last week, how do you do that? It's through abiding or connecting with God, recognizing our powerlessness, our desperate need for him. And I kind of unpacked that last week. And this week, we're, we're talking about how do we actually do that? How do I abide in the vine or remain in the vine, as this John chapter 15 says? John 15, 10 says it like this. When you obey my commandments, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. You remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. He then goes on in chapter 15 to talk about uh, love each other in the same way I have loved you. And then he says this, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So how do we love? By doing the same thing that Jesus did. Uh, there's a passage that I quote often, uh, it's a very popular passage from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, which is the Great Commission. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey or observe all that I've commanded, and behold, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. Uh, John Mark Comer, who wrote that Ruthless Elimination of Hurry book, spoke uh, about preaching this passage in a revelation that kind of God gave him as he was preaching, which was, I have been spending my life teaching people what to obey and not teaching them to obey. Sounds really similar. And certainly it's important to know what to obey, but there's a difference between just having it in your head, which is important, and getting it into your heart and into your hands and feet. To love the Lord your God with all that you are. This is the dad in me, but I just kept thinking, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. But I think it applies. To get it into your body to teach them to obey. Another way that you might uh, translate uh, disciples could be followers, followers of Jesus or apprentices of Jesus. And what a disciple was to a rabbi, which is what Jesus was, a teacher, was a disciple wasn't only aiming to get head knowledge from their rabbi. In other words, their goal wasn't to be able to recite everything that their rabbi said at the end of their days, though that would be part of it. But actually that they would emulate him, follow in his footsteps, do the things that he did. As John Mark Comer wrote, another way you might translate, follow me, is apprentice under me. You might paraphrase it 
like copy the details of my life. Take the template of my day-to-day life as your own. If Jesus is fully God, fully man, and I want to be with him and I want to become more like him, wouldn't it make sense that I would look to see how did he live his life? What type of things did he do? And how do I learn to live into that? If he cared about the poor, then I ought to do that. If he sat at the table and ate meals with a lot of people, then I ought to do that. If he had close, intimate relationships, then that seems like a pretty good method for me to grow about becoming more like him. If he's Sabbath, I should do that prayer, silence, all these types of things. The message um, version of Romans 12, 1 through 2 from Eugene Peterson says this. Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. And there's a, I, I mention this guy often. He's one of my favorite spiritual writers named Henry, uh, Henry Now, and he was a Catholic priest and in a book uh, called Spiritual Formation by Now and that um, I think they were compiling a lot of his works after he passed. It was with Michael Christensen and Rebecca Laird. He was talking about discipleship. And he said, discipleship, however, calls for discipline. Indeed, discipleship and discipline share the same linguistic root from desir, which means to learn from. And the two should never be separated. This next statement is pretty dense, and I'm going to unpack it. But it's really good. Whereas discipline without discipleship leads to rigid formalism, discipleship without discipline ends in sentimental romanticism. I said the statement was a little dense. Discipline without discipleship, basically meaning... Uh, If I'm just going to go about, these are the things that I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this for me, I'm going to do this just for for the sake of doing it without actually uh, being committed to following King Jesus in all of my ways. In essence, it just becomes like a square box that I'm trying to live into, some form of legalism, obligation that is not good but negative. Um, Obligation can be good, but this obligation would be negative. On the other end, discipleship without discipline ends in sentimental romanticism. Uh, In other words, saying that I want to follow after Jesus and I love Jesus, but then I rebel against anything that actually is discipleship, learning from, apprenticing under, doing what he did, that actually just leads in kind of a feel-good sentimentality that actually does not produce who God has made me to be. Um, One of the things that John Mark Comer uh, talked about was in his church that he realized that he and a number of people in his community had plateaued in their spiritual growth. That they learned all these right things about God but had not actually been transformed more to be a person of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the things that God wants for you. And that doesn't just happen through your head. So what's, what's the... What's the way to go about this? Well, first, it's that connection piece. But secondly, through formation. Uh, Some would refer to uh, a couple dimensions of spiritual formation. Um, Does anybody else, when I say dimension, think of like Spider-Man or like multiverse or any stuff? But I haven't even seen it, and I'm thinking of that. Uh, There is, some would refer to an active dimension of spirituality and a passive dimension of spirituality. Gerald May uh, said that the active dimension of the spiritual life consists of what feels like one's initiative, choice, or effort. The passive dimension seems to be more initiated and carried out by God. So the classical example of active spiritual formation or spirituality would be things like the spiritual disciplines. Passive would be God did something in me. I'm walking through something hard I wouldn't have chosen, I didn't do it, but God met me in a moment and something happened. Now, of course, uh, both the active and the passive both require both parties, right? Particularly God. Uh, You're asking God to do something in you when you engage in the spiritual disciplines. In the passive dimension, you're left with a response of when you're walking through this thing, how then do you respond? But we obviously can't control the passive, right? But we do have an opportunity to join with God in the active. So how do we do this? One ancient way of doing it is through something called a rule of life. 
Now, depending on your background, as soon as I say rule, uh, some of us in the room are like, great, I love rules. Give me a rule and I'll follow it. And others of us in the room are like, Lord, no, no rules for me. Uh, that does not sound helpful. A rule uh, traditionally uh, comes from a word meaning a straight piece of wood. Uh, it dates, a rule of life dates back at least to the 6th century with a guy named St. Benedict. It basically was a way of structuring one's life around what is of utmost importance, of structuring your life to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. Um, it was used also, uh, so tradition goes, as a reference to a trellis for a vine. So thinking of this John 15 language about abiding in the vine. How do I abide in the vine? Well, as John Mark Comer pointed out, what a trellis is to a vine, a rule of life is to abiding. It's a structure. In this case, a schedule and set of practices to set up abiding is the central pursuit of your life. It's a way to organize all of your life around the practice of the presence of God. To work and rest and play and eat and drink and hang out with your friends and run errands and catch up on the news all out of a place of deep, loving enjoyment of the Father's company. And so the idea is, behind a rule of life, is that all of us have one, right? If you want to get physically fit, what do you do? Probably, well, it depends on your personality. Some, some people in the room probably like going to a class, having a coach, uh, having a fitness trainer if you want to get a nutrition coach. Some of us uh, would prefer not to have that interaction, and so we just Google it and find Chris Hemsworth workouts um, or Daniel Craig workouts, and then realize I can't do Daniel Craig or Chris Hemsworth <laughs> workouts. <laughs> Some of us just go that route. But we, we look to follow a plan in order to produce the results that we're aiming to get, right? But then for some reason in our spiritual growth in life with Jesus, we think that's just going to happen by osmosis. I'm going to show up at church on Sunday, and God does something when we show up here. This is one of those rule of life things, I think. But we think it's just going to happen to me while I'm continuing on eating junk food, and I'm not going to the gym and working out, and I'm just thinking about, and I'm reading about, you know, maybe I'll do this Crips Hemsworth workout today. <laughs> but I did not. Similar for your spiritual life, there actually is a pathway for you to take your next step with God into becoming who you are created to be. And a rule of life is one way to do that. The idea is that you already have a rule of life. You have things that you do without even thinking about it. When you wake up, what do you do? I'm not asking you to answer that for me, but just in general. Uh, do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you go to church? Are you part of a community? Do you work out? Do you, what type, do you like prep meals? Do you go out to eat? All this stuff is included in a rule of life. It's a set of practices that shape you into your, who you're becoming. And crafting a rule of life is just about being intentional with it. The idea is that you already have a rule of life. Um, and so the question is, what is yours? And then the challenge is to evaluate it. And so here's what this means for us. If you've been with us for a while as a church, this is not new language for you. Uh, if you're newer with us, this is probably new language for you. Um, what it means for us is that we orient uh, our church around connecting, uh, around connection, formation, and mission. And so this means practically for us that we invite people to participate in a rule of life. Um, and for those that choose to call New City their home and join our church as members, we ask that you Sign on to say, I will do these things with these people to hold each other accountable. You can almost, it's not quite the same, but you can almost think, out of, think of it as like a workout accountability group. Um, I know my friend's going to do this, and so I'm going to do this with them. And so each year, what we do is we have a couple of focal practices that we ask members to commit to doing together. And then we invite everyone else to do it uh, as well. We also have recommended practices um, that can vary based on your season. Because that's one thing about a rule of life, too, I just want to make a point to mention. Depending on your season of life, uh, different things become easier or more difficult. As a practical example, after having uh, one kid, and definitely after having two kids, having a regular set, like I know in the morning what time I'm going to wake up, is very difficult. I do not know. And when we get to sleep in at all, praise the Lord, that's an aspect can be of my rule of life. I'll call it that, and I'm so thankful. So quiet time in the morning became a little bit more uh, unpredictable, but things like fasting became a whole lot easier and more attainable. Because I might not be able to control what time I wake up, but I certainly can control whether or not I eat. And so that became a more regular discipline for me. So here are the focal practices for us this year. Uh, one is generosity. 
for those that are members of our church, that we uh, ask people to commit to giving and supporting what God is doing in and through New City, uh, both with finances and with time and resources. And just as like a quick shout out to all of our um, volunteers, some of whom are members and some of whom are not, uh, they have given so much of all of those things uh, to help make this a reality. And so I just wanna say from up front, um, again, thank you uh, for that. But we invite everyone to operate in a life that is generous, um, to consider, am I generous with my time, my table at my house? Like, am I generous? Do I welcome other people to be part of, of my life in that way? Another one that we emphasize uh, as a focal practice is Sabbath, which is one day each week to abstain from work and intentionally rest and worship. And then the last one is fasting, to abstain from food or something else for the purpose of seeking God, that we fast on the first of the month uh, to seek after Jesus together and join together um, in praying for those who may not have an active relationship with with Jesus. Um, and uh, this year we did a series on prayer. We did a series, we're going to do a series on fasting in a couple weeks. Um, and then we're going to do another series on silence and solitude. And the goal of all of this is for you to take that next step in your life with Jesus to encounter who he is and what type of life that he's actually, uh, that he's actually made you for. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And here's kind of what I would um, love to challenge you to do this week. Um, there's probably a number of different personalities in the room. Uh, my personality is to, you could probably tell based on my workout example, uh, is I tend to go like all in um, and then burn myself out uh, pretty quick, as evidenced by saying I wanted to do a Chris Hemsworth or Daniel Craig workout. That's not necessarily the most sustainable thing. I heard somebody talking about going to the gym, and this is not my field of expertise, but they said if you don't have a pattern of doing it, maybe you just need to start by literally just going to the gym. Go there for five minutes, don't lift anything, leave. <laughs> and once you do that regularly, like, cool, like, do a little bit more. Um, and, and I used to do student ministry, and I think that's true with reading the Bible, too. If you've never read the Bible, it might be really hard to start out and say, I'm going to read my whole Bible in a year. Maybe God gives you hunger to do that, and praise God, do it. Um, but maybe you need to start with, okay, I'm just going to get in a regular habit of I'm going to read the verse of the day today. Get that, regular, repeated where it just becomes like second nature. And then, okay, cool, like two verses, a chapter, and grow it from there. Um, don't be like me in my natural tendency to go way too hard on it and then burn yourself out and then not actually do the thing. So my challenge for you this week would be to consider what are the practices and things that you do in your life? And just if you're honest, are they shaping you and forming you into who you even want to be? And more importantly, into who you are created to be. And central to all of this is I am, um, uh, is, is we're gonna wrap up with, with praying and responding to what God is doing, um, is connecting with God. Uh, abiding uh, isn't, and spiritual formation isn't just about like what I do and developing these things within me, but it's something that God does within me. I do these things, uh, I do things like fasting and reading my Bible and praying, not just to tell you I do them, or to like look at this rule of life and look how cool this is. Mine's actually not uh, as impressive as I know a lot of, uh, I know some that are super impressive, um, which is not the point. The point of it uh, is to create intimacy between you and God, inform you into being more like Jesus. The point of me, of us fasting or praying or reading a Bible is not simply to read the Bible and check it off. Sometimes it feels like that. It's to grow you into a person of love to connect you with God. And so all of this stems from, if God doesn't show up, I'm wasting my time. Um, if the Lord isn't here with us, I, I'm wasting your time too. I'm wasting my life. But I believe that he's here. And I believe the Lord comes where he's wanted. And I believe that, um, as Henry Nouwen said, the way that you kind of start with connecting with God is through embracing your powerlessness and bringing that to him. So I, I'd encourage you, just as we uh, get ready to pray, think of the ways in your life that you are uh, trying to become something that are not working out for you. Think of the pain point in your life and bring it to Him and just say, God, I desperately need you. And let's see what He does. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for being here with us in this moment, in this space. God, I know um, we have people... Uh, probably in this room that are in a variety of places in their faith journey, some that have been following for a while, some have, uh, in the room that feel tired and burnt out and worn out. Lord, I pray for um, 
those that you draw them into intimacy with you. Um, Lord, that you just remind us of your presence here. Um, Lord, that as we lift up our weaknesses and we lift up these uh, things in our life, that you would meet us here in a powerful and profound way. Uh, For those in the room that aren't so sure uh, about whether or not they believe or what they think about this whole uh, Jesus thing, and maybe even can get behind the idea of like intentional practices to help us grow into who we're made to be, Lord, I pray. um, I pray that you just show them your presence and your love. Pray that uh, they recognize and for you, um, and Lord, that you just overwhelm them with a sense of your presence with us in this moment. God, you are with us, you are for us, and not against us. And I'm so thankful to know you and to love you. And so, God, I just ask again, um, Lord, help us to abide in your presence. Um, help us to be uh, focused in on you in this moment. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. We pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.